thank you very much for this invitation and for establishing this dialogue. And uh, thank you, th I, th I want to thank you very, very dearly for um, allowing me to participate in it. It's really a very, a very special and a very important uh, meeting. So I would, uh, you asked me for a Portuguese perspective uh, of the way out of the crisis. And uh, I would start by saying uh, that um, the way out of the crisis is only possible inside an European framework. Individual countries cannot do much. And inside the European framework, nothing can, not, can be done if Germany is not engaged and if Germany doesn't want to do it. So this is also another reason why I think it's absolutely essential that we exchange points of view. I will not try to convince anybody of anything. Uh, I think the purpose of this meeting is the, that we understand different points of view on the same subject. And. Uh, at this moment, it is particularly important that we exchange these points of view because uh, the complexity and the multitude of crises that Europe uh, is facing seems to have reached a kind of make or break point. And um, the risks of disruption of this fantastic project that is seen as an extraordinary democratic thing from outside, or used to be like, seen like that. But the risks of, the, of disruption seem to be sometimes bigger than the chances, chances of survival. And if there is a disruption, I think it will be a major disaster. Uh, we all know that the final objective of the European project has never been clearly defined. This was on purpose. It was not a precise vision of where we wanted to go. And uh, among the six initial founding members, uh, peace and reconciliation was, seemed to be enough for the project to go. And then, as time would go, we would be adding things and countries to the project without ever addressing the conditions for the follow-up of this process in a very deep or clear way. But also because this was the method, the answers were very often kind of improvised, patched, uh, and often also unfinished. Uh, and as soon as the urgency vanished, the project would stop there and not be completed. And uh, I think, as an economist, but now as a politician and as a Portuguese, that uh, the Eurozone, the building of the monetary union, suffered exactly from this problem. Because, uh, and this is reflected in the way the Europe has reacted to the Euro crisis uh, and the way we have addressed the Euro crisis uh, had very simplistic explanations and these strange, strangely simplistic explanations in relation to a very, very complex project ended up in a huge rift between the core and the periphery this rift is dangerous. It drags in a lot of propensity for extremism and revolt, a lot of misunderstanding of what is going on, who is at the driving wheel, where are we heading to? And above all, I think it broke the most essential element for the European project, and this is mutual trust. It's not a problem of Germany. Germany doesn't trust, probably, the southern countries, are, but, but also in the southern countries, peer, people don't understand what is the agenda of Germany. And this is a most uh, poisonous 
uh, element that we can bring to a project that is based on mutual trust. The European answer uh, to the crisis was uh, uh, Germany, I would say Germany driven. This is a fact of life. And there is no negative evaluation of this. Because Germany is now the leading country. But sometimes it is, our perception is that Germany having this leading role is not really intending to lead and probably is not aware of its power and of its capacity to lead. And this power has got to bring with it the responsibility for leadership, which because it's non-intentional, often is not there. And this is a kind of problem that uh, seen from the outside is not easy to resolve. In fact, the prevailing view at least the one that the media brought to us during the crisis, was uh, that uh, the Euro crisis was a consequence of the non-compliance with EU rules by some of its member states. And then there was a kind of a flood of new regulations and rules, and it's the competitiveness pact, it's the six pack, it's the fiscal compact, it's the two pack, so it's a multitude of new legislation. And this is, as I said before, a kind of a simplistic explanation because, I mean, no country decides, and I can, I can confirm from the Portuguese side, that, okay, we are going to ignore the rules, and we are going to cheat on rules, we are going not to care about the compliance with rules. This is not <laughs> anything that any country decides. But if you have a different angle of perspective, probably there are some mechanisms that are embodied in the Eurozone that lead to a lack of compliance, at least in times of crisis. What are these mechanisms? We knew, all the economists knew before we started this project of the monetary union, we knew already. And it's not, you don't need to have a PhD to understand that if you are competing in an open market Strong partners with weak partners, the strong partners are going to win in principle. And if you add to this a common currency so that you can't disguise your permanent losses, you cannot adjust to it. So you'll go on like that forever. And then if you add to it that we are the last country on the West and that European Union enlarged to the East, with very low costs, with a lot of co labor costs, with a lot of, of competitiveness in tech systems as well, and with a kind of natural uh, growth associated also with the cultural and historic links with, with, with Germany, that all the center, your economic center of Europe went to the east. And on top of this, you have globalization. So you have the kind of productions that were done in the south and east and west of Europe that were different from the ones from the center and the north. They were mostly affected by the newcomers and the borders of Europe in relation to China or in relation to India. They were determined by the different, different, uh, differential powers inside the common area. So they didn't really help. Even though the Portuguese, that are a special kind of country, we are still very much, for political reasons, for solidarity reasons, in favor of enlargement. So you see lots of people coming, and they are most welcome, because you understand that life is like this. But having said this, uh, since the origin of the common currency, if you go back and you see the viability studies that were done by the law, for instance, uh, the group, the the law group in the 80s, they were saying that a monetary union could not function unless you had a budget, a common budget of at least 5% of European GDP. We still go on with less than 1%, and we enlarged, and the challenges are even bigger. So, I mean. Um, this is something that we should reflect about um, bef because, uh, in fact, the progress of the Eurozone didn't, didn't follow uh, the texts and the, these studies. 
And we got the currency together with a very strange agreement that we call Stability and Growth Pact that was agreed politically uh, between ministers uh, without any solid economic uh, debate or, uh, or background. And we went on. And why did we get in if we knew all this? We went in because at that time, and I was there working on these issues, and so I know it's not, it's not from the books, there was this kind of concept that um, if or when uh, the need would come to complete the architecture that we already had, that the political, uh, the political will inside Europe was so strong and we trusted each other so much that we would have the political capacity to complement the model with anything that we would recognize that was missing there. Okay, but in the meantime, what happened was that all these changes, all these adjustments created accumulating enormous fragilities in terms of competitiveness in the weaker economies, particularly in the southern and west uh, parts of Europe. And when the crisis came, and it came from the financial market, don't forget that, so it was the financial market that originated the crisis, but when it came, the impact of the, uh, of the crisis, of the 2008 crisis, uh, broke completely uh, the, this kind of, of, of environment, and the splits became evident, and then the Commission looked at the toolbox, and they realized they had nothing to, to help, they had no tools to address the problem. And this was the moment when uh, we started to create a very strange kind of uh, solutions that, uh, that, still, <laughs> that still are around. Uh, the most uh, paradigmatic one is probably the Troikas, when today we were asking to comply totally with the existing rules and the rule-based approach, and we are always talking about rules, and it's important that also in Germany you put to yourselves the question, where is the legal basis for the Troikas? And, uh, is, but of course, in an emergency situation, I don't think we can go through the rules. If you, if you have to pay a ticket when you leave the car park, but if there is a fire or an earthquake, you have got to let it go because it's an emergency. Okay, I accept that, but an emergency cannot last for six years. It cannot. I mean, and there is no democratic accountability to the Troika, even when they do all sorts of strange decisions that are absolutely against the will of the people. Okay. Then we go to another perspective again. Often we hear that with the Euro, Germany sacrificed its own interests for the benefit of Europe and was rewarded with this irresponsible behavior by the partners. But from my perspective, the opposite is true. Uh, Germany has been the most relevant beneficiary of the Euro because uh, you have the whole market to your benefit, it's the internal market, you are very, very determinant in setting the rules for competition. And then also you accumulated a lot of surpluses and the Deutsche Mark never went up. So because you are associated with countries that accumulate deficits. So if you were by your own, you would not have the exchange rate of the euro as you have now. And this allowed in a way, it prevented the automatic mechanisms that usually correct these elements to operate. So it is a permanent self-fulfilling thing that surpluses will go on and on and on here and deficits will go down and down and down in the others because we work in the same market, so what one gains, the other, the other loses. Uh, and the external market is very important, we can address it, but the internal market is still a very important element. So. Uh, this, this kind of narrative, I think, was never explained to the German citizens, and so they don't understand that uh, this is a fact. Then, the, then there is another element, it's the quality of the adjustment during the crisis. Uh, here I could go uh, and touch why 
why the bailout on Greece was as it was, but I, I, I just want to subscribe what has been already said by Philip. What, the reason why there was such a big intervention in, in, in Greece was that otherwise the loss of value of, uh, of, of the German and, and French banks would be immense because they had been lending and the overlending was not a, was a decision but it was imposed uh, in a way, uh, by the activity and activism of banks that were absolutely out of control and lending as a method of simplifying uh, their, their business and, uh, and, uh, and, gaining, and gaining with, with the management of the risk. But, uh, but uh, 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 that has, uh, has already been addressed. It is, it is also accepted that, okay, now we impose an agenda on these countries and uh, they will have to fulfill. Portugal has fulfilled to the limit the imposition of the Troika. Uh, there was an, another government, a different government from the one that is there now, and we fulfilled to the limit because we said, okay, that's the solution, we'll go through it. But during the process, there were so many abusive things done in a democracy. The, you cut pensions that were agreed with the state to a limit on which people cannot survive. But even the estimates, the technical estimates, imagine, I'll give you just two figures. Uh, the estimate for the, the idea was, okay, you readjust and then you are okay, you are fit for the competition. Things were done in such a way that the estimate in the program, for instance, for the reduction of the loss of GDP, of, of, of wealth, it had to be reduced, of course, if you make austerity, if you, if you re... But it was estimated to be of 1.8 in the program. We ended up with 3.2, minus 3.2. The unemployment was supposed to peak at 13.3%, 13% of unemployment. We went over to 18%, and this is only registered unemployment. The debt was supposed to be squeezed and to have the peak in at the level of 115. We went to 130. So nothing worked as it should for several reasons. One of them is that it became a kind of an ideological thing to adjust downwards. But the other thing was that the same recommendation was done to all the deficit countries and Germany didn't want to expand. So it's not a kind of a very sophisticated thing to understand that if everybody cuts, you don't consume, you don't invest. And if the countries that have surplus don't consume and don't invest because they want to profit to have a surplus budget, then there is no engine. So enterprises cannot sell to anybody inside the market. And the banks that lend to the enterprises, they go bankrupt because the business is not good. So, I mean, this is a kind of, of, of strange environment that people don't understand. I'm trying to oversimplify the idea because it, all the details, the economic details can be addressed. But in spite of this, all the recipes didn't, didn't achieve what was uh, expected, even in Portugal, that we did, we complied incredibly with everything that was said. But the final outcome was that the country lost investment. We cut investment in education, in science and technology, uh, and the best people on which we had invested to be qualified, they emigrated, uh, and, and the countries, uh, we had to sell the energy grid, for instance, to the Chinese, uh, to the state Chinese. Uh, so it's, a, it's really a, a, a strange kind of situation for a kind of uh, medicine that is supposed to heal the uh, lack of competitiveness of the, of the patient. So, uh, now, uh, the future. I, 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 will, I will very quickly go to th through two or three elements. First, I think um, at this moment uh, we, we are faced in Europe with the need to complete a series of other, of other dossiers to reassess seriously what we can do in relation to the monetary union, what we should do. It has been said here before, I think it was you, Ulrike, that said uh, 
we know exactly, but political will is not there. So how are we going to, to, to do it? We are doing the same mistake with banking union, on which we created new legislation, a single super, European supervision for banks, European resolution for banks, and now we are stopping the, guarantee of the common guarantee of deposits that people don't understand why, uh, uh, with same rules and same supervision, they should, they should be more volatile one deposit than the other. Uh, so it's, it's against the, the concept itself. But, but now we have other crises, we have the refugee crisis, and in spite of all these complications, I think uh, in, in Portugal uh, we understand uh, Germany's position that has been that uh, each country, uh, well, we need to be soli uh, under a, a spirit of solidarity. People sometimes dare to say, well, but Germany didn't really think it was a common problem, the Eurozone problem. Uh, they thought that it was just uh, each country had to solve by itself the problem, which was unsolvable. So, but nevertheless, uh, believe it or not, Portugal wants to help in the refugee crisis. So now we, are, uh, we have uh, 4,000 places for, in this first slot for, to welcome uh, we are very poor, but our mentality is like this, okay, we have one loaf of bread, we split it, I mean, no problem, we'll, we'll get it through. But no, no refugees come because of the lack of organization of the system. So we are waiting for them, people open houses for them, and we are waiting for them just because it is our, our way of being. So, but solidarity goes in both ways. Now, if you ask me what is happening now in Portugal, it is again a very strange thing because um, the, there were elections. The coalition of the right that implemented all this agenda from the Troika um, uh, lost the elections. Or, I mean, they won the elections, but they didn't have sufficient uh, votes uh, to have a government by their own. Mm -hmm. And so the old left. Uh, had a huge majority criticizing the excess of the Troika. The Troika is not there anymore, they left, but now we would like to have a little bit of investment, a little bit of growth, a little bit of employment, because otherwise the country is finished I'm, uh, economically and socially. Uh, and so people voted, and this is a very strange thing, but the government that is now in power is a government that uh, is a social democrat, uh, moderate, pro-European, the same party. Uh, in, say, in, in, Euro in the European Parliament, we are in the same group of, uh, of SPD, but there are lots of differences. And this party came as a moderate alternative to the, the right. And this moderate alternative received the support of all the parties, even the Communist Party, the extreme left, in the parliament. They didn't want to come into power. They are not members of, they are not ministers, they are not inside, but they are supporting the government uh, on, uh, uh, in the parliament. Uh, the program is a, a very moderate program. Um, it's a program that tries to adjust and to comply with the EU legislation of stability and growth pact and all the requirements. But nevertheless, it has been, it has been negotiated um, two or three weeks ago, and the, it was absolutely incredible the difficulty in having it accepted by the Commission. Uh, and uh, we really don't know uh, it was, but it was accepted. And uh, now, let's see, I mean, but it, and the comments that we hear are very strange because, um, uh, I mean, speaking very frankly, you have a great coalition here, a grossa coalizione, which is a, ga a good solution for Germany. But if you tell these countries, and I'm not speaking of Greece, because Greece is a kind of a caricature of all this. If you tell Greeks or the Portuguese, or, there are no alternatives to this agenda, people go to the extremes. So I would expect that Europe would really support very enthusiastically that the most extremist alternatives are intelligent enough to say, okay, we'll support. Uh, it's not our agenda, but it's a moderate agenda that will not take austerity as such a 
good thing and that will help us to get out of this. Well, the party in charge is uh, the party of Mario Soar, who was a very close friend of Willy Brandt, of Helmut Schmidt, uh, is the same party of Antonio Guterres, and we spoke about the, um, the Lisbon agenda. And uh, so it's really, uh, I mean, a very pro, very pro European, and the same party that asked Portugal for joining the EU in uh, 86. So it's exactly the same party that came, came forward. And uh, to finish, I would just say that uh, I think this is a very, a very difficult moment in the life of Europe. I think we should go back to basics. And if you ask me what is the most important, the most relevant thing that we have to do now is before everything else, to stop demagogic, simplistic, simplistic explanations to what happened. Because it is not true, so we have got to go back to basics, back to pure economics, to the initial elements of the project, to analyze very clearly how this can function, and to stop the blame game that creates a lot, a lot, a lot of... Uh, of bad feelings and uh, that hurt people very seriously that uh, don't see anything wrong in what they have done. They just joined in a very open and a very uh, even emotional and they are still in that mood, uh, the European Union and even Germany. I can just uh, inform you that in my hometown, believe it or not, there is a public monument in Portugal, in the north of Portugal, uh, to Willy Brandt for, to thank uh, the German people from that time uh, and uh, the Friedrich Herbert Foundation for what they had done. And of course, there was a lot of help, monetary help. But what people recall is that you had a lot of things to teach to us. You taught us how to organize institutions. We didn't know. We had been for 50 years under a, a dictator. You helped us to understand how democracy could function. And so, believe it or not, there is this monument. I, I would love if in 10 years' time I would have another monument for German people. Thank you very much.